All right. Hi, I'm Victor, and I'm going to present today the project I was involved in at the University of Passau, which was my master's project, together with uh, my co-student Benedict and our supervisors, Secret and Andrea. So end-user programming. End-user programming is defined as um, programming to achieve a task uh, for rather personal as opposed to public use and can involve examples such as advanced customization, such as your uh, intelligent assistance on your mobile phone or smart homes, and or data analysis and exploration by um, uh, domain experts. However, as we all know, programming most uh, of the times involves a programming language, but most end users are not trained programmers in any of the programming languages. Therefore, the rise of different end using programming paradigms, such as graphical compositions, as we see over here, Scratch, where you just combine blocks to create your program, or based on natural language, where you um, uh, combine, um, tr transform natural language into um, <clears throat> uh, code statements, or based on workflows which you define, such as IFTTT here, um, where you can uh, combine different complex workflows based on the uh, based on incoming events, or programming by examples, and multiple linear combinations thereof. So, since um, my expertise is NLP, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about programming, uh, end user programming with um, natural language. So, how does it look like? What we want is we want to convert a set of uh, natural language operations into uh, programmable, uh, runnable code, such as here above. So that is not a trivial task, as it involves uh, multiple steps. First, the user that wants to write a program needs to abstract his ideas in form um, of some formalisms, which are then later to be express, um, expressed in some programming language, uh, such as uh, coming up with a pseudocode of the prob problem. Then, uh, once the programming language is chosen, um, the user needs to familiarize itself with the syntax. Is it a square bracket or a round bracket? Do I need a semicolon here? How does it work? And even if, the, uh, when all this is settled, uh, programming uh, using uh, instructions from a certain API, um, there's the semantic gap where a user needs to understand what are the names of the functions that are being called, how, are the, how do the function actually work, is it an in-place operation, what are the parameters involved, what are the types. So all of this, our system needs uh, to be able to uh, infer from the text to the uh, code here. And there are different approaches to do so. Um, uh, with the resurgence of deep learning, there are multiple end-to-end -end approaches, which take um, as input uh, a user story, a couple of statements, and uh, employ some uh, um, deep learning algorithm uh, to uh, produce a runnable code. Now, that is a nice uh, approach, and uh, as it uh, involves um, no interaction from, from the human, and uh, it can be expressed a machine learning problem, and there's uh, a couple of approaches, and if you want to see more, just have a look into the paper. Uh, but we are focusing on uh, some slight diff slightly different approach, that is uh, programming step by step. So given uh, we want to break down the uh, interaction into atomic units, which are uh, code statements, and we want the user to express one single code statement at a time, which our system then uh, transforms into code, uh, actually into multiple um, code statements, and the user has the um, flexibility of selecting the one which he thinks is most suited to what he tried to express with his intent. And we iterate o over this process as long uh, as the program is complete. So how do we do that? Like this. Okay, this slide is a bit cluttered. Let's uh, make more sense into it. So. Um, it basically involves three steps. By first, we perform semantic parsing to obtain a, a logical structured form from the unstructured natural language query. Then we generate candidates uh, from uh, code statements of the API we are trying to program based on the current code state. Uh, so we won't initialize the same init um, variable twice, for example. So the, the proposals generated here are uh, already syntactically and semantically valid based on the code state. And uh, then we rank the candidates to be most similar to the uh, natural language utterance uh, which issued the candidate generation. So let's uh, go more into detail. 
Um, we, uh, semantic parsing, we do that to extract a structured representation of, uh, from natural language, and we do that by combining a, or by employing a pipeline of off-the-shelf tools uh, to perform uh, uh, tasks such as dependency parsing and uh, lexical uh, uh, role extraction. Basically, we uh, deploy a couple of tools and uh, combine the operations to assign to every word in the sentence a semantic role based on that extracted syntactic and lexical information. <clears throat> Once we have the structured representation, we generate uh, candidate, uh, candidate statements, and the goal is to generate uh, these candidates, which make sense based on the code state, and also prepare them for the f uh, future ranking. So therefore, we extract the semantic roles from, from the pairs and their relations, and we build uh, sets of pairs uh, with the related aspects of each API resource, which is allowed at that, at that position. Now that's a bit cryptical, what does that mean? Let's have a look at the example that probably makes it more clear. So we observed that um, semantic roles such as action and object, which would be like rotate or robot from our example, uh, tend to refer to methods and class names, such as turn or robot again. So we built uh, pairs um, of, of this, um, semantic roles such as a rotate turn and robot turn for the method turn. Th that, that would be our um, feature set for this uh, method. And we repeat that for different semantic roles. So for example, if we have um, values in our text that would probably refer to parameters, if we have uh, other objects that would probably refer more to um, parameter names. So we overgenerate uh, this set of pairs in order to be used for ranking later on. So uh, the candidate ranking we use, uh, the goal is to obtain a numeric representation of every candidate to be um, yeah, optimized towards to rank uh, the um, proposals which are more related uh, higher in the list. The, to, uh, to that end, we extract a fixed size feature vector from, uh, for every um, statement. And we do that by uh, uh, utilizing the sets generated above. So we use, um, uh, we compute the distance for every pair which, which we generated in the previous step. And I mean, it could be every distance, but we use added distance such a, for, for the string distance and a word embedding distance using pre-trained word embedding such as word to vec or glove. And we reduce the number because the number of pairs is variable. We reduce it to a single number, again, using any re reduction operation such as max, mean, or sum. And based on these features, we learn a, a ranker uh, using a simple classifier. Um, in, the, in that case, we used SVM uh, based on the learn to rank approach uh, at an offline phase. In an online phase, we rank all the generated uh, candidates accordingly and present the top K um, uh, choices to the user to, for him to finally disambiguate. Right, so that's how it works, but how, uh, does it really work? So concretely, does it really work? Um, the questions are, so are users actually able to learn to use the system proposed? And are they uh, able to do so by, uh, to solve simple programming tasks? And uh, is, uh, is programming expertise uh, necessary in order to be able to interact with our pro problem? Because in the end, we did not really focus on the design gap. So, um, we did uh, focus on the semantic and the syntactic gap introduced earlier, but uh, maybe that's what makes a good programmer, you know, the capability of abstracting ideas into uh, some formalisms. And since we uh, had some non-negligible um, uh, effort put into building the pre-processing pipeline and the semantic parser, we want to know whether it makes actually sense to do so. Uh, do users tend to use complex commands uh, which uh, just justify the usage of a semantic parser or is it just more like um, key ba key based search key keyword based search and in the end how do users uh, perceive the usability of the system so how do we aim to answer these questions um, we conducted a usability study with 12 users to perform two tasks um, the first task is we threw the user into the system uh, by just uh, explaining how the system works by showing one screenshot. And then after the first task was done, we explained step by step what has to be done in order to solve the task and give a full introduction to the system and then uh, presented the user with the second task. 
The tasks were related to a simulated environment of a hospital to program robots, and we measured the time to complete uh, the tasks. Uh, in addition, we had six programmers and six non-programmers, and we compared the time to complete between both in order to, um, uh, to investigate whether programming expertise actually may, uh, played a difference. We also measured the query length as an indicator for the complexity of the natural language commands, and uh, we used a SUS questionnaire in order to uh, assess uh, the perceived usability of the system in a quick and dirty way, which um, might uh, be prone to the experimenter bias. <clears throat> so this uh, is how the tasks look like, and they um, need <clears throat> um, uh, to complete those tasks. It requires six, respectively, um, 11 lines of code. And this is the results we obtained. So for the first task, we see that uh, clearly programmers are uh, more efficient uh, on average than non-programmers. However, after a brief introduction and the full explanation of the first task, we are able to achieve similar um, uh, completion times of the tasks on average. However, um, non-programmers are still more distributed, so there's more deviation from the mean than from non-programmers. So to summarize our observations, um, first of all, all uh, participants were able to complete the task. Uh, completeness was measured by um, having a syntactically sound program so that there are no um, unbound variables, for example. And uh, it actually performs semantically to achieve the task uh, that it's supposed to do. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, after the introduction and uh, detailed explanation, uh, non-programmer users are able to achieve um, similar performance times uh, to, uh, to program for the second task, even uh, albeit with more distribution of the individual times. We also um, found out that users tend to um, use a very short uh, query length for most of the interaction, uh, shorter than three words, which uh, more looks like um, <clears throat> more looks like keyword search than actual uh, expressing of the intent uh, using uh, complicated sentences. And our SUS score after evaluating the questionnaire was 85.4. And according to a normative study performed by Jeff Sauer with similar, over 500 similar systems, 68 is the average. Again, take this number with a grain of salt because it's a very quick and dirty way of evaluating it. It's not a in-depth uh, study. So, Linking back to our research questions, or to our questions uh, which uh, motivated our evaluations, so are user, users able to learn? Yes, at least for our simple tasks. Does experience matter? Again, after a, a, a learning curve and an introduction, it seems like both uh, control groups are able to perform similarly, at least for our, uh, for our uh, small uh, tasks. Um, is complex natural language understanding necessary? At le again, for these tasks, it seems like it's not really necessary because uh, users tend to fall back to very short queries, uh, in, uh, include, uh, including three or less words. And yeah, well, the users perform, um, uh, users uh, perceive our system as above uh, average usab usable. So to summarize, um, we used a step-by-step -step approach versus a, a black box program generation. Uh, our users for the tasks we introduced to them uh, tended to use short keyword-based keyword, keyword search as opposed to full sentences. Um, an interesting detail is that uh, this approach is almost training free and is useful for um, custom APIs where there is no resources available such as um, the Stack Overflow questions answers where, where you don't have necessarily enough resources required to train a deep learning model. So, yeah, that's Vira. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Victor, for the presentation. Any questions? Yeah, so you said it was for um, exploration of APIs, mm -hmm. and the examples that you showed are all sort of single sentence examples. So is it to take a single sentence and get an API call or do you deal, do, are you trying to uh, have, you know, 
multi-line programs with conditionals and recursions and right. calls and stuff? If I, that's a good question. Thank you for that because I skipped over the fact. So um, as I mentioned before, there are like three gaps, uh, the design or three barriers, um, also introduced by a, a um, study by Coental. So we're not aiming to um, try to uh, capture the user's intent in a very high level way. So for example, if, if um, the, the intent would be take this and bring it over there, our system would not be able to understand that. So we're, um, we're assuming that the user already has some sort of understanding of a formal uh, uh, understanding of the code and it's just really more of the single statement uh, exploration of the APIs in this case, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I had some difficulties in understanding in a real case how this approach can actually work because you said you can interpret only small short sentences so I mean if people interact with a robot I mean they may ask to do various things so is this composition impossible to address with this approach or so that's um, that's a good question and I think to answer that we would need to have a um, evaluation scenario which involves actually more uh, complex tasks, more complex than just, um, all right, just take the robot and make it speak, um, because this actually involves just, the API is designed to be able to um, address this task directly. So if it was uh, for a more complex task where the API calls tend to get more complex, we, needed, we would need to um, make a more thoroughful evaluation whether it still holds that uh, users are just using just two or three words or if they actually try to come up with longer sentences to express their intent. So um, to summarize, I cannot say based on our evaluation right now. Uh, so I was wondering what the programmers did in speaking um, with the robot that made them faster in their first attempt. So did you look at the differences in how they, uh, how, how they asked for things um, compared to non-programmers? Like, what did they do differently? So to answer that right, we, we, I have, um, we have more on that on, in the paper, but our, um, our take on that is that non-programmers tend to uh, trust the system uh, and the predictions uh, faster than programmers because um, the way it works is that some uh, of the par some of the paradigms, such as first, like as a programmer, you would first um, uh, initialize a variable and then make it do something, while the system here would uh, f actually first make the variable do something and then propose, hey, you actually need to. Var um, need to initialize that variable with some uh, meaningful uh, value, right? So, um, because non-programmers don't exactly understand this, they just roll along with what the system proposes, and this, while um, programmers, uh, it, it's against their gut feeling to first um, uh, use a variable and then introduce it in an earlier uh, code, in an earlier line of code. So they would come with the system more, that's what our take is why uh, programmers were not still consistently faster than non-programmers, if that makes sense. Um, so in the first task, they were, however, faster. Um, and that that um, is in contradiction to what you just said. Um, of the right, but in the first task, um, there was also no introduction to the system other than just, okay, so this is the system, you can click here. Um, to produce, uh, you can type here to produce, uh, your, to, to input your query, and then you can click here to select an answer. Um, I think I, I will ask you this later on. <laughs> okay. To, to get actually sure. a, a Please. deeper understanding. Thank you. I'm sorry. So I'm trying to understand uh, in what sense the users are actually doing programming here, because any uh, voice interface will eventually translate it to code, right? If I, my kids like to use uh, Siri to set a timer, a very silly thing, but you know, say, hey Siri, set my timer for set, set a timer for 20 minutes, and eventually it gets translated into some kind of code on their iPad. So I wouldn't call that programming. 
So, in, so how is this, uh, how is what the, studio, the your users are doing here, in what sense is it actually programming as opposed to just executing a command? Right, so it will actually convert it to... <laughs> that being said, great. Um, so um, it, the, the system will actually produce valid uh, Python code. So that's programming in that sense. Okay, the, the code will be constrained by whatever you're trying to um, achieve, but uh, you, um, users could use that, uh, again, to see how their command is being transformed into Python code, which is actually runnable code and can be run, run anywhere, not only on their environment, providing you have the API, if that answers your question. I think there was one last question there. Can you go back to your user study slide? Just, yeah, I just have a quick question. So I wonder how did you communicate the task to your users? Did you show them those words or? Um, th thanks for the question. I, we printed um, it on a piece of paper and handed it to them together with the explanation. So the, the second task was handed together with the um, explanation of the first task. Uh, the first task was uh, together with a screenshot and a short uh, description of the UI elements of the system. Um, I think it's, it is an appendix uh, to the paper and you can see right, what right, exactly it looks like. Yeah, the reason why I bring this issue up is because one, one issue of evaluating a natural language interface is that if you give the task in the form of text, basically that's likely going to bias the user's response. So like if I'm a user, my most natural response would be I'll just basically repeat what's, what's said on the piece of paper I'm given. So I guess that's uh, basically my right, question. Right, but, um, but uh, yeah, to, to um, th that's a good point. Um, w and we didn't report that, but we made sure that by just typing this text, um, the, the API commands are not just like a rephrasing of, of this text in code. Uh, so there, there are differences. Uh, it's a good point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, Victor.